Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Reedy Zell. I'm the Nashville City Partner for WeFunder. I'm up here with uh, Johnny Price, also from WeFunder, and Jonathan Bragdon of Capacity Capital. Uh, we're here today to talk about the future of capital. Uh, WeFunder and Capacity are presenting together because we both believe that uh, community should play a big part in the way that people raise money. Uh, and that there are new tools out there that founders can make use of to raise more money faster, more effectively for their companies. Uh, like I said, I'm uh, the Nashville City Partner for WeFunder. Uh, WeFunder's been around since 2012, but we're uh, beginning to focus on building, uh, building community around raising capital in different cities. I'm the first city partner, but we hope to kind of build this network out across the southeast and across the country of people who are focused on individual cities where uh, they can support founders to raise capital. Uh, hopefully we'll be in Chattanooga very soon. Uh, I'll be quiet for a minute and allow Johnny and Jonathan to introduce themselves and then uh, I'll ask them some questions. Yeah, great. So we also came down with Reed in the car from Nashville today. I'm from the UK originally. but. Um, Lived in San Francisco for uh, the last 10 years and then about a year ago moved to Nashville with my wife and three kids. And I lead the, the fundraising team at WeFunder. Um, so as we've mentioned, we're uh, equity crowdfunding platforms so helping startups raise capital um, from their customers and community. Um, did anyone here invest in Chattanooga Football Club when they raised on WeFunder? Okay, well, I did. <laughs> so I'm a shareholder in your town's uh, soccer club, Chattanooga Football Club, which is pretty cool. Invested 125 bucks, um, and so now I'm an owner of CFC. Haven't made it to a home game yet with the Chatter Hooligans, but I hope to change that soon. Uh, and yeah, just excited to talk about um, what, what we mean by uh, a more democratic approach to raising capital over the next few minutes. Jonathan Bragdon. I've been here in Chattanooga for a long time. I am a... Uh, I guess you, some people say serial entrepreneur. I've built a few businesses. I've been through a couple letters of the alphabet raising capital, but I've also bootstrapped. By the way, I'm curious, how many in here are running a company right now, like a, like a fat, consider yourself a, a founder, like a startup founder right now? Okay, how many of you have raised outside capital? In other words, more than just, okay. All right, cool. And then I guess you're all curious about raising outside capital. Okay, good. Um, so, so my background as a founder, um, you learn you know, 10 times faster than you can reading books or on the outside listening to somebody's stories. So I'm glad a lot of you are on that adventure. Uh, I learned a lot about what to do, what not to do, a lot of scars on the capital side. And so now that I've jumped to the dark side and we actually write checks, capacity capital is a fund um, which we can talk about at some point in a few minutes. Um, but we also have a, a, a consulting group that we work with founders on a regular basis, whether that's coaching or basically bringing a SWAT team in to solve problems. But most of the time, we're just connecting dots from a network standpoint. Where are the gaps? Who can help you with that? Because that's what I always wanted as a founder. Uh, yeah, you'll hear a little bit more from Johnny and Jonathan, who both know a lot about raising capital in different ways. Um, we just, we both believe, we funder and capacity, that this region and Chattanooga and Nashville are all really primed for growth, and we hope that everything that we do can help accelerate that. That's what we're all about, is uh, expanding and accelerating the ways that early stage founders are able to access capital. Uh, to get us started, Jonathan, uh, just tell us a little bit about how Capacity came to be and kind of what your mission and, and thesis for what you're trying to get done is. Well, the last, I guess the last company that I sold out of um, was a bootstrap company. It still exists. I just got to sell out of it to partners, um, which was another fun situation. Um, and thought, well, I have, I've never raised a fund. I've been an angel investor, I've invested in companies, but I've never raised an actual fund and realized that's, that's a startup. So let's just do another startup, but make it a fund. But venture capital, as I started to run the numbers and laid out the scenarios, I realized pretty quickly, 
if I was going to take other people's money to invest into businesses, if I was going to use the venture capital model, it would be a lot like me going to Vegas and picking worse than black and red. It'd be like playing poker. You know, just like, uh, uh, odds would not be very good. So I backed up and said, I, that whole venture capital model isn't broken. It's just over applied to more companies than it really should be applied to. And I've lived through some of that and I've also seen it succeed. So I wanted to build a different type of fund that was really focused in on businesses that thought a lot more about revenues and margins and long-term growth and sustainability than about valuations and quick flips into an exit from somewhere else. And in, in studying the models that did that, there, there just there weren't very many. That, you, know, you could do debt and you could do equity and you could, you could find friendly equity and there's a lot of great angel investing groups that are really focused in on small businesses can do pre-seed and seed and, and, the, and that's fantastic. But there's a pretty big gap between equity and debt and how that works. We'll talk more about some of that. So our fund, we tried to create some of you financial people in the room are familiar with the term mezzanine. We tried to create a micro, micro mezzanine type fund, which is a vehicle that you use when you, you can buy buildings like this. You can get a little bit of equity and a little bit of debt, and there's a gap in the middle. It's mess. Like, well, can't you just do that on with $50,000 checks or $200,000 checks? So that's what I looked for. And we ended up building out a, a structure We've, we found some other misfits like me around the country, and the way we invest is we'll write, say we write a $100,000 check. We're not taking equity in your company right away. We're taking a right to that equity, but that right to your equity can be redeemed back over time through a percent of revenue, right? And what it really creates, we put other mechanisms in it to create optionality for the founder. So if, if you as a founder decide, I wanna make a 50 year company and I wanna own all of it, you have that option. If you get 18 months in and realize you have an amazingly scalable business that's gonna to go to the moon, is gonna take a lot of fuel, you're in a great position to go raise venture capital. Those options sometimes go away if you raise the wrong type of capital too early. So we're trying to be in the, in the middle of that. And it's worked. We've, we've got, uh, we're in due diligence on our seventh investment since last year. Uh, we also seem to attract uh, a different type of founder. You know, 80% of our founders are either women-led, minority-led, veteran-led. That's a, that's a very different portfolio than most venture capital. And, uh, and we're already returning capital back into the fund. We're already recycling capital, which is also unheard of in about a year. Uh, so we're having fun, but we're, we're still learning every day. But that's, that's the capital side. Could, could I just add one thing to what you said, Dave? You, you said something which was um, venture capital is sometimes misapplied, right, to a business that maybe is a better fit for a revenue share based structure, but it's kind of squeezed into venture capital because that's the only fun type of investment structure that exists, and, and probably also that's the like glorified path, right, in the media that's like the success stories of venture capital, and so every founder thinks that's the only path. Um, but as, as well as like sometimes companies get VC funding when maybe they should get a different investment structure, I also think the opposite problem is the case where there's a lot of companies that are good companies they are investment worthy companies. They need some fuel to get to the next level, um, but their total addressable market is not in the billions. So they're never gonna like, get that kind of venture backable growth curve. And so they are not interesting to VCs that are doing kind of conventional like equity investing. And so I, th I think you've got kind of those, both of those problems. And what I love about what, what you're doing and other you know, revenue-based financing, and then you have like Ernest, when well, our Calm company, they have the SEAL agreement, IndyVC was doing their own thing as well. Like these alternative structures in between venture capital and bank there, not only are, are companies then gonna get capital that's more appropriate to them, but like way more companies can now get funded, which is a, a big kind of 
thing we're trying to do at WeFunder as well. Uh, it, it works for, sorry. I mean, I mean, the, the landscape is way bigger. The, the, and this is both for founders that feel like they can't get access to the capital they need to grow, but it's also true from the other side for deal flow for investors, right? Because most investors, whether angel or professional, you know, venture capital investors, or even some of the debt structures, it just doesn't fit. And so all the conversations with the founder ends up being one-on-one -on -one type of a conversation. Well, you're not a fit for the fund, or you're not a fit for this equity, or yeah, you don't qualify for this loan. And our overall group, we look at this more as, what, what is the capital structure that works for your company? Because uh, we do think it's backwards for a, a, a founder to design their company around what type of funding it should get. It should be the should be the opposite. We're trying to flip that a little bit. Uh, obviously, so one of the things that we talk about at WeFunder all the time, like Johnny said, is democratizing access to capital. But it's also about diversifying the ways that, that companies can grow, uh, like Johnny was talking about. Johnny, uh, WeFunder is a platform for regulation crowdfunding. I don't know how many people in this room know what that is, but Johnny, can you kind of describe what, what exactly is it that WeFunder does day in and day out with companies? Yep, so most startups raise capital today using this SEC exemption, which is a fancy way of saying, you know, a, a way that you can raise capital um, using what's called Regulation D. Um, and in Regulation D, as a founder, you, you're basically raising from accredited investors. So when a VC fund like Capacity invests, they're, they're investing through Regulation D. Um, and so WeFunder is the largest um, regulation crowdfunding platform, so it's a, a different SEC exemption. And what regulation crowdfunding allows you to do, as opposed to regulation D, is two interesting things. One is you can raise from unaccredited investors as well as accredited investors. So about 5% of the population are accredited, and that basically means you're a millionaire, or you had $300,000 household income, a million dollars of assets excluding your primary residence, but basically, the richest 5% of the population. Um, and our founders back in 2012 were serial entrepreneurs, wanted to invest in their friends' startups, and thought it's kind of frustrating that we can't invest in our friends' cool startup because we're not millionaires. <laughs> and uh, I always think it's funny that, that the British guy is like, says something like, you know, they said, this is not very American. And our, our, our kind of tagline on WeFunder is, is like defending the American dream. So here's like the Brit from London in Chattanooga defending the American dream. Uh, but but uh, anyway, so they said, you know, it's, it's very un-American that like only rich people get to invest in cool startups and private companies. So regulation crowdfunding allows you to raise capital from anyone. Um, and then secondly, the second thing that it does is it allows you to publicly promote the offering. Right? So it, it, no longer do you have to privately solicit people that you have existing relationships with, but you can put your campaign up on Facebook or you can email your whole customer base. Or as Chattanooga Football Club did, you can print out yard signs and put them in people's gardens all around town saying, like, be an owner. I can't remember what the slogan was. Um, but uh, so in those two ways, um, we believe we can make it easier for founders to raise capital. Because you can publicly promote, you can raise from anyone. You also uh, get in front of WeFunders investors. We have about a million investors now. We have probably about three and a half thousand investors here in Chattanooga because that's how many investors there were in the Chattanooga Football Club campaign. And probably most of those live here. Um, and so then what we're trying to do is when a startup founder in Chattanooga goes live on WeFunder, we can email those three and a half thousand people and say, hey, a new startup in Chattanooga just went live, check it out. Um, they click on, on your page and hopefully like what they see and invest. And you can invest for as little as $100 on WeFunder. Um, average investment is about 1000 bucks. Average company raises about 350 grand from 350 people. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the mechanics of regulation crowdfunding. And then I think like what, what we're trying to do, kind of similar, similar to Jonathan, you know, we just hope to get more capital flowing to startup founders throughout America, basically an aggregate. We think the, the socially optimum investment in startup founders 
in this country is higher than what it is today. And we believe we can get that number higher in aggregate over the next 10 years. Um, but then also if you disaggregate, right now very little capital is flowing to female founders, very little capital is flowing to founders of color, very little is flowing to founders in Tennessee actually. 77% of venture capital goes to three states today, California, New York, and Massachusetts. So we want to use our platform to try to level the playing field you know, and use democracy to get more capital flowing to founders here in Tennessee. Um, and then on the investor side, it's kind of like basically why should um, rich people have all the fun? Um, it's cool to be an angel investor. Let's open that up to everyone. And there's risks associated with that. And um, you know, it's, you're kind of oftentimes, if you're investing in equity, you might be locking your money up for seven, 10 years. Um, but again, we, we think it's cool. You, you can go to Las Vegas and put $100 on the spin of a roulette wheel. So why can't you, you know, invest $100 in Chattanooga FC or coffee shop down the street from you or a tech um, you know, SaaS startup that your friend um, started? So that's, that's kind of what we mean by democratizing investing in startups, letting a anyone become an angel investor, not just a credit investor. Both of you guys have mentioned uh, kind of the oversubscription to the VC model. And, and I think in our case, with, with, with regulation crowdfunding, there, there's kind of a negative perception sometimes around it. Johnny, first to you, and then Jonathan, I'll ask you a question. Kind of how do you think, why, why do you think that, that perception exists, and how, how is that changing, uh, and how is the, the, regu the, how is the, how is the reality of regulation crowdfunding changing? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll speak to, to the WeFunder piece he can speak to the, to the kind of investment structure piece, but you know, for, the, for 80 years, it wasn't legal for you know, me as an unaccredited investor to invest in startups, right? So the law had to change, which it did. The, the Jobs Act passed in 2012. The SEC rolled out regulation crowdfunding in May 2016. The laws were just updated, actually, a few months ago to make it much more conducive for founders. So now you can raise up to $5 million per year, um, previously it was one million. Now we can roll investors to one line on the cap table very easily using an SPV. So the range now is like 50K to 5 million on we funder. And so the law had to change. So that was like <laughs> pretty, pretty important. Um, and then I think for the last five years, since the laws have been live, there's been this kind of negative stigma associated with crowdfunding. And that, I think that still persists today, but I think it's dissipating now. But it's been like, you, ha you only went to WeFunder if you couldn't raise from real investors. Um, and I think that's now starting to change. Mercury Bank is um, a bank for startups, fintech company that they just, they raised 120 million Series B from Co2 and Andreessen Horowitz and big VCs, and then opened up an additional five or $10 million um, of investment into them just from their customers. They didn't need the money at all. They just thought it would be a good marketing play, like a community engagement, like marketing investment, to allow you know thousands of their customers, which are startup founders, to become owners in Mercury. And so, when we have more and more examples like that, more and more success stories, where it's very clearly not a kind of, oh, you had to go to WeFunder because you couldn't raise money from real investors. You went to WeFunder because you thought this would do good things for your business. That, I think, is how, over time, the, the perception will shift. And so, hence, we would, this panel is like the future of capital raising. Obviously, we're biased that we fund that. <laughs> but we think like raising money from your customers and your community is going to be a big, big part of the future of uh, raising capital. I think, Jonathan, yeah, it's kind of getting to that point of the future, right? Regulation crowdfunding is obviously changing. You were saying that uh, just a little while ago, when you were beginning to talk about revenue-based financing, with capacity, there weren't that many models like that out there, like, like what you're doing out there. How do you see that changing, and, and how do you see that kind of growing with alternatives like Rexia? Well, I think the variety is going to continue to, to get much more diverse and granulated, again, to where the funding will actually be designed to fit the company. You know, and I, think, I even think this language of stage is going to go away eventually. Um, Pre-seed and seed, those are, those are big buckets that even when you're talking to different, even at the VC level, sometimes it means different things. And so I think, I think that democratization is not just 
who's investing, but how you even define what investment is. If you back all the way up to, I think, where you need to start, which is at a founder level, I want to start a company. Um, I can't do it purely through revenue. So where do I get the fuel? And you, what tends to happen, or has traditionally happened, is you just go through that sequence. Well, can I, do I have, you know, can I get it? Do I have an asset that I can sell? Uh, do I have a savings account? Do I have friends or family? And you just keep going through that sequence, right? Oh, maybe a bank. Oh yeah, a bank's not gonna loan it to me. I'm less than two years old and I don't have any collateral and maybe my credit score isn't there. Well, what typically happens then is, is this big leap all the way to, maybe there's an angel that'll put money in and bet on me. Or maybe this is a big enough idea that VC fits. But between those things, it's or just maybe easy. I can't make this business happen, and I'll shut it down before fully exploring. Yeah, I, I, I give up. I can't fund it. Yeah, and and so we all lose if that was actually a really great company. So the the different mechanisms of funding should fit that gap, and so we're only one tiny piece trying to fit into that gap. I mean, I think there were, I think we met in Kansas City. Co you know, pre-pandemic, <laughs> that's when we met. But there were, there were five or six people there that were working on this problem, and that's how a few misfits. And every one of us were looking at it in a slightly different way, even though it was all revenue-based or some kind of income-based uh, in-between debt and equity model. And I think there's a ton of them. Um, so I, I think it's gonna continue to, to stride out. Plus, you're seeing a lot of stuff happen in just in FinTech in general. If you can securitize uh, streams of, uh, you know, you've got subscription models and pipe, yeah, like pipes jumping in, going, hey, we'll secure some of that, uh, securitize it. It'll cost you a little bit, but we're really doing this for the investors to be able to invest all the way down to a subscription stream. That is just beginning. So I, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun for funders and for companies. Obviously, both these models that we're talking about are just just developing. So could each of you guys kind of reflect quickly on what do you think the biggest drawbacks are, drawbacks of uh, the, each of the models that you're using? What are, as, as a founder, if I'm looking at, at raising capital, what, what's kind of the biggest risk at using a revenue-based a, a revenue model or Rexia? I grab that. One, one interesting, one, one thing to remember, keep in mind is, uh, structures for funding is different than your process for going to get the funding. Like we have a platform like WeFunder. WeFunder can use pretty much any of these structures on the platform. Yeah, not all crowdfunding platforms. There's what 1,600 crowdfunding platforms right now. They're the biggest. There's only one. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably more. Um, but. Most of them don't have, like, most of them are very specific, like Kiva, Lee was in here earlier, Kiva is very, very small debt, uh, very tight community type of a structure, but it, as you, as you go up and you actually need real money to build a business, you're now looking at probably three buckets. The debt bucket is you have collateral or something that a debt provider will need to grab if you don't pay them. Now that can be all kinds of things, right? But most of the time, a really early stage company doesn't have any collateral to grab. That's what, you know, a lot of people get surprised you have to sign a personal guarantee to a bank at the very beginning. Well, that's because they aren't really betting on your company cash flow. They're betting they get their money back if it goes down. It's, a, it's that side. On the other end of venture capital, it's just a math problem. Every bet that a venture capital fund makes should be big enough to, to basically return the funds because the failure rate is pretty high. These are high risk, high return type bets. So then the middle rev based is supposed to try to run that gap in the middle. Some, some revenue based debt takes a little bit of capital, I mean takes a little bit of collateral, but not as much. And they have a maturity date and all that. The revenue-based equity, which is what we're doing, doesn't take collateral. And there's no maturity date. We're betting a little bit more like an equity player is. But from a founder standpoint, it becomes a choice of venture capital has 
needed controls in the agreement. In other words, if you don't, if you don't, if you can't deliver the 10x returns that are out there, there's going to be some mechanisms to ratchet in the control for that for for that venture fund, and they need that. On the debt side, you're going to give up some collateral because you didn't go to the other side. Now it's less expensive. Debt's less expensive because the collateral is there. Equity is the most expensive money you can get in, you know, if you're successful. Debt is the most expensive if it's a failure, <laughs> right? And then you can ride it in the middle. Now, uh, revenue, revenue ba any revenue base is going to have some cash flow. You know, you're going to have to think about cash flow coming out to take a percent of revenue out. Uh, that's, you know, as you're growing, can you still grow fast enough and cover that, cover that uh, growth? You know, equity, you don't have to, typically don't have to worry about that because they're not taking cash out along the way. They're waiting until your valuation is big. So there's, there's a lot of different elements to it. It just depends on your business intent, like how you want to grow and how fast you want to grow. I hope you guys are impressed by how Jonathan took a question of like, what are the downsides of raising a revenue share and turned it into the downsides of uh, raising from banks and VCs. <laughs> Nicely played, sir. No, you did get there at the end. You did get there at the end. We're still downside. <laughs> it's just a matter of fit. <laughs> um, I think the main downside of WeFunder, raising money on WeFunder, is you need to publicly share financials. Um, so um, you, uh, if, you're, and if you're raising more than 250K, they need to be kind of uh, reviewed by CPA uh, or audited if you're raising more than a million. And so there's some founders are kind of reluctant for whatever reason about putting their financials into the public domain. And so if you, if you kind of want to keep your numbers close to your chest for whatever reason, then probably WeFund is not a good place for you to raise money because it's a, a pretty transparent kind of public uh, way of raising money. And then the other thing is like, I think we're actually an expensive way of raising money um, in the sense that we charge our standard fees are seven and a half percent. So if you raise a million bucks, we keep 75K of that and send you 925K, which I imagine is probably more expensive than um, you know, raising money from you know, maybe angels or VCs. Um, so, uh, yeah, those are probably the two, the two downsides of raising a WeFunder, I would say. And like, like I mentioned earlier, there is, there is a kind of prestige um, or kind of um, signaling concern, but I think that's being, that's being answered. It's like, if, if that's not really applicable, if you could raise money from real investors, then a confident founder can very easily just bat that away of like, no, I actually could have raised from a VC. I just thought it would be cool to let my my customers invest instead, or as well. And if it if the signaling is like justified, <laughs> it's like actually yeah, right. Like I did get turned down by every like VC whose door I knocked on. Then <laughs> yes, I guess the signaling is true. But what are you going to do? <laughs> um, and we can I think help you if, if the, the the kind of list that Jonathan articulated of. Is there an asset I can sell? Can I get there with cash flows? Do I have friends and family? Blah blah blah. And then there's the gap. Like as as with capacity, we want to kind of be filling that gap and be an, another option for founders to get that first 50, 100k, whatever it is that enables them to you know get more traction to get to the point where you know more conventional investors you know are, are willing to give you a more serious look. I'm going to add a benefit to. to to the crowdfund thing, uh, if there's also a residual effect to it. I mean, most other transactions, most other funding is a transaction. Debt's definitely a transaction. It's just, here's the money, you agreed to do this, don't screw it up. Venture tends to come with some support structures around it, so there's some residual, but it's very tight, right? It's with the founder or the management group. Um, and revenue base is t typically the same way. You lean equity, you're going to have more support structure. You lean debt, you typically don't. But with crowdfunding, it, it's very community oriented. So you have this local community that you're inviting inside the tent. And now they're not just investors on a transaction basis, they're fans. I mean, that's why CFC did it that way. Um, and you have this engagement that you typically aren't going to have externally with other types of funding. And so now they basically took all these other types of funding and 
put it into the crowdfunding platform so you could have that benefit, which I think is fascinating. And that's, I love that we're on the stage together because I think there's a real complementarity. I think sometimes, maybe in this conversation at times, it's been like, you know, the crowd versus like conventional investors. The, the sweet spot for me is when you can do both, right? So when Jonathan invests in you, he has like a wealth of experience, like having started companies himself, like deeply, you know, gonna really help if you're making your seventh investment, like that's a small number of investments that you can really dive deep with, right? Maybe take a board seat with, really understand the business model, add very deep kind of, you know, help and expertise for those founders you're investing a large check in. And exactly what you're saying, like when you have the crowd invest in you, you're recruiting an army of a thousand customers, evangelists, you know, if you want to hire a software engineer, like you got a thousand people that are financially incentivized to share that job description with their network. Because if you find a great engineer and build a bigger company, they're going to benefit financially. So the complementarity of the value that the crowd can bring and the deep expertise that an institutional investor or you know, angel investors can bring is like, for me, this is like, you know, it, it's complementary as opposed to like competitive. And that's actually where I was going to go next is like, how, how, how do these things complement one another? Um, so thanks for getting there before me. There, there's more. Yeah, there. you go, go dive, on, dive deeper, go. So, um, deal structure actually can complement across these, these bands of tools as well. Like we, we have invested alongside equity and we've invested alongside debt. And there are companies that, you know, if it's, if it's equity, a company gives up a little less equity, a little less ownership if, if a vehicle like ours comes in. And on the debt side, uh, there's, a, there's you know, sometimes the debt can't cover, can't get the number up high enough to get a company over the threshold that it needs to be. We've seen a lot of companies, this is a sad commentary, but you see it too much, that they may need $200,000 to get to the next equilibrium, and somebody offers them 100, and they take it. And what you typically see is the company goes up, spends the money, can't make it to the equip equilibrium, and it drops through the floor because they, they can't they can't figure out how to do that. So this is a way to actually stack some of these up. They actually do fit together pretty well. Um, yeah, we're just one tangible example of that. We there was a gelato company in the Bay Area that I worked with, and they, they wanted to move into a new facility. They needed a $2 million loan, um, and basically they, they used WeFunded to raise, um, they needed 480K, in the end they raised 640K, but that 640K of equity then unlocked their $2 million loan. Um, that was one of the most stressful campaigns I ever did, because a lot of campaigns, the minimum is like low. These guys had a minimum of 480K, and then if they got that, it unlocks the $2 million. So there's like a lot riding on this one. And with like a week to go in the two month campaign, they were at like 250K. And then they raised like 400K in the last week and everything worked out well. But a good example of the investment structures. We talked uh, about this one, one last week in Nashville that they were originally, like they were building and they thought, we're, we, we gotta go raise money, we need $2 million. And the thought was equity. But when you start walking through what they needed, they ended up about maybe half of that needed to be equity. And some of it, they already had some angels that would support part of it. They could crowdfund a few hundred thousand and the rest of it, they were able to find some debt and they're off to the races and they own more of the company, but they had more support on the equity side of it. And it was, it's, it's a, it's a, those type of things, when it works out like that, it's great. I think we're gonna see that more often. I think that this is that's a, that brings up something interesting. It's like it, when when a founder is using all of the tools at, 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 at the, that's available to them, it's bringing down uh, the threshold for all of them, right? Using all these tools alongside one another makes each one of them easier. Um, what do you think the kind of what's the the one piece of advice, the one piece of most uh, that, that most founders that you speak to? are overlooking for getting, like failing to consider in, uh, you know, in, in raising capital in a way that kind of makes full use of these tools? I guess one thing I see a lot, we talk to probably three or four companies a day now, and I talk to 100 companies before ever even, 100 founders just in Chattanooga before even spinning up the fund. And I think the, the single most uh, surprising thing that 
for me, although I had to learn it the hard way, was money that you bring into your company is not, not all that money is the same. It's like hiring somebody to your executive team, right? So revenue is pretty easy and there's not a lot of, you know, ties to it other than you need to deliver on the revenue. You need to deliver the product, right? That's a certain type of relationship with money. Debt's got a different type of expectation. Equity is a different type of expectation. But thinking about it all the same is I need 500,000 and I just need it and whoever can write a check or wherever I can get it from, doesn't matter. It, it, can be, it can be great to get it, but it could also really, if you get the wrong kind, it'll, it, it'll kill your company and you just don't even know it yet. So. I'm gonna just ask these guys one more question and then I'm gonna open it up to you guys to ask any questions that have come to you guys. Um, we're here talking about the future of capital, and I think both of our, as I said at the beginning, both of our models are kind of community-oriented models to raising capital. Uh, we're from, Johnny and I are both based in Nashville, but we're obviously close, close, close by to Chattanooga. Both are cities that have immense potential, I think, in the next 10 years. Um, what do you think, in 10 years' time, the capital landscape looks like in Chattanooga if, uh, if this, the types of, types of investment models that we're, ta we're talking about take off? Jonathan, you first, and then Johnny. 10 years? It could be five, it could be, pick your time frame if you'd like. Well, I, I do think, I think an automated version of most of this stuff, that the way you interact with funding is gonna change. It's gonna be a world of change, even in the next five years. I mean, you know, the pandemic changed some of this because you had to automate a lot of things that weren't structured this way. Uh, and, but I think it was inevitable. That just sort of sped it up. And now you have some very well-funded FinTech companies coming in that can attach straight into bank account subscription agreements. And I think what we're gonna see is those are the sort of the easy first financing tools that are in there because there, there are already platforms for doing subscriptions. You know, the banks, I think banks are in trouble, to be honest. I think in five years, banks that aren't shifting gears really, really quickly today are gonna be dead. Um, especially the ones that are working with small businesses. If, um, but I think that what we'll see is the easy markets, the, the subscription-based, the SaaS-based companies, those are easy to fund because the data is there. I think you're going to see the data start to get easier to connect, and so you're going to have different businesses easier to fund, or at least to analyze what funding fits, and that's going to automate pretty quickly. You're not going to have to go through, hey, what's going on in the back office back there, and how many weeks is it going to take for it to be underwritten? You're going to be like, I, I just gave this to you this morning. <laughs> is it a yes or a no? Um, I'm, I'm pretty biased uh, in my perspectives on the future of raising capital, I'm pretty we funder centric but uh, you know, we, we kind of looking forward to a, a world where like, everyone in this room would know about, we funder like probably everyone knows about Kickstarter, right? Um, or like everyone knows about, oh, you get angel investors or VC or friends and family and it's like, well, you know, raising from your customers on an equity crowdfunding platform is as ubiquitous as like well known as a way of raising capital. So that that's one. Um, and then secondly, probably related, um, and like Charlie was saying in the answer to the last question, like you know, money is is green, but like you want to raise capital from like on the right terms, the right investment structure, but also aligned capital, right? If you want to build, a, if you have a huge vision for a company and you want to invest the next 20 years of your life growing this, like building this cathedral, and you take money from a, a, a VC investor that is putting pressure on you to sell with within a three-year time frame because, like, they need to, you know, get capital back to their LPs, like, there's a misalignment there, and that's going to cause challenges. Um, and so we aspire to, you know, when you raise capital and we fund it, you're doing that because this, not just because it's money and you need money, but because this is extremely valuable capital for you. And the best way I think we can get there is 
because we recruit this army of brand ambassadors and loyal customers for you. So we're here in Chattanooga Whiskey um, event space. Like if there's, if there's two distilleries in a town, if one of those distilleries raised, you know, let's say $3 million from institutional investors, and the other distillery raised one and a half million dollars from institutional investors and one and a half million dollars from 2,000 like citizens of that town, customers, whiskey drinkers, like I would, I would bet <laughs> that the, the second one that has this army of champions that are gonna go there more often because they're owners in that business, that's actually a hugely valuable asset for that second company. And so for me, over time, if we can deliver on that promise, then in 10 years' time, the idea that you wouldn't allow your customers to own at least part of your equity as you build this company um, is, uh, will just be kind of seen as weird. Like, well, of course, like, that's going to do good things for your company. And by the way, you know, we're, like if you look at the concentration of wealth in the hands of the top 1% today versus 40 years ago, the top 1% has a lot more wealth today than they did 40 years ago. And I believe one of the reasons for that is the only people that could get to invest in Uber's seed round were rich people. And so as a startup founder as well, if you can spread that wealth around people in your community, that's kind of a, a cool thing from a like, you know, kind of sharing the wealth that we're creating from capitalism more broadly. So that's, that's a, we're a public benefit corporation and we fund a B Corp. That's pretty central to our, to our charter as well. So that's, that's the future for, for us, I think. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to help it, but I'm gonna have to add to that. Um, that's a very, like even though the language that you use is very, hey, we'd like to, we'd, we'd like to democratize this whole uh, system and more people get involved and not just the rich people. I agree with that 100%. I also agree there's a, the other force involved in that is truly capitalistic where w when you talk to Gen Z, at least few that I talk to sometimes, um, they really want to know where their money's going. They don't want an intermediary. intermediary. They want to, if I'm going to invest, or I'm gonna, even if I'm going to give, I want to know directly what's going on. I don't want it just hanging around on Wall Street. I want to know that. I want to believe in what the company's doing, and the more transparent that becomes, and the less friction between that, the whoever's writing the check and whoever's using the capital, is gonna that that's something else that's gonna transform. So there's gonna be a lot more local. I care about that local company, and I'm able to actually impact it financially, not just buying product, but by investing and being part of my portfolio. And so it'll be a bunch of micro portfolios, I think. That's, I mean, it's already happening. Like five or 10 years? Uh, obviously, we're excited about the possibilities of revenue-based financing.